Okay. Great. So good afternoon, Invalid again, entry. everyone. Um, this is Gail Jaffe from SPRC. I'd like to welcome you to today's web webinar on measuring grant impact. Uh, we are recording this webinar. It's going to be posted on SPRC's website shortly. And we'll be monitoring the chat box throughout. You'll see that below um, where you are seeing the PowerPoint slide currently. So please take type your thoughts, experiences, and questions into the chat as we go. Uh, we also have the phone lines open, so you can participate in the discussion that way. But please keep your phone muted when you're not speaking. And there are directions um, right on the slide, but I'll also read them um, to you. To meet your phone line, press star and then the pound sign. And then you do the same again to unmute your line. Um, and that'll help to uh, cut down on background noise. OK, so these are the SPRC staff who are on the call today. So there I am on the left. Um, we've also got Julie Eben, who's a senior prevention specialist with SPRC, and Kristen Quinlan, who is an evaluator scientist and she is working with us um, at SPRC and we're really lucky to have her um, on board in general and with us today. And then we have three presenters today. I'm really so happy to have them with us. Um, we have Rob Asseltine from the University of Connecticut where he is the professor and interim chair in the Division of Behavioral Sciences and Community Health and Deputy Director of the Center for Public Health and Health Policy at UConn Health. Uh, he also is the Connecticut Cohort 10 GLS Evaluator. And from Texas, we have Brian Hoppe, uh, who is the Director, the cl Clinical Director, rather, of Crisis Services at Tarrant County MHMR Center. And he was a Texas Cohort 8 partner, um, or is. And then we have Tammy, who is the Administrator of Crisis Services for Denton County MHMR Center, also a Texas Cohort 8 partner. So our session today, um, we're going to cover a number of different areas. We are going to go over the objectives. Um, there will be a chance to hear from your GLS colleagues who I just introduced. Uh, we'll be able to share your own plans for demonstrating success. There will be discussion and questions and an opportunity to talk about next steps. So the objectives today are to understand creative strategies for using surveillance data to demonstrate grant impact on, sur on suicide deaths and attempts, to describe successes and lessons, lessons learned in creating partnerships to access that data, to identify resources needed to carry out each type of strategy, and to articulate preliminary thoughts on how you plan to measure success in your grant. And we're going to do all of that in 90 minutes. So <laughs> it's a little ambitious today. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, if you would um, chat into the box below and um, just enter your name, the GLS project that you're on, and the role that you play on your grant. I see a couple people are typing. She said, type in our grant. I'm sorry? I thought I heard somebody on the line. I may have imagined that. Um, we are going to get folks chatting on the phone um, in a bit, too. And yes, for the person who asked um, about typing in the grant, if you could do that, that would be awesome. All right. So we have Jane Timmons Mitchell, um, who is with the Ohio GLS grant. Um, welcome. She's an evaluator. Um, Andrea Dewart from Connecticut. 
Um, she's the co-project director there um, for their Cohort 10 grant. I'm going to actually increase the text size so I can read it. Um, we have Suzanne Hardman, um, who is project manager for evaluations in South Carolina GLS project. Um, Dorian Lamas, who's the evaluator for the Georgia GLS grant. Kelly Cunningham, Danielle Bolduc, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, and Alan Holmland with Massachusetts. Dave Murday and Casey Childers with the South Carolina Evaluation Team. Sarah Wakai with the University of Connecticut Evaluation Team. Um, and then it looks like uh, we've also got Mira Nara Simman, which I maybe just butchered, um, evaluation um, person with South Carolina's grant um, again. And um, welcome to all of you. It looks like there's a question in here. Oh, and there are more people. Um, so Sally Vanderstraten, um, who is the acting project director for Georgia's um, GLS grant. Tiffany Clark, um, public information coordinator for South Carolina's grant. Um, Kelly Cunningham is the project director. Um, Danielle is the project coordinator, and Alan is the project um, or the. Um, Principal investigator, sorry, <laughs> brain freeze, um, with Massachusetts. And then we've got Louise Johnson, who is the South Carolina GLS grant um, principal investigator. Okay, and Julie just entered um, instructions on how to make the chat larger. You can also change um, the color of your font if you just go to the drop-down menu. So thank you. Um, Do we miss anyone? Did anybody else want to chat in um, who they are and where they are joining us from today? I know I see some other folks um, in the attendee list. And it looks like Chelsea Booth is typing. And Chelsea, um, some of you may know, is GPO from SAMHSA. And she has really been um, a key point person for data and surveillance subject stuff. So we're glad to have her with us today. Um, I see we also have some additional representation from Ohio um, and maybe one or two names that I don't recognize. but. Um, thanks for chatting in, and let's go forth. So at this point, I am going to um, turn things over to Rob. Rob, if you are ready to go. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we in Connecticut have approached using data to guide our pre prevention efforts, principally associated with the GLS. This is now our third GLS grant, and I've been, uh, I've been um, honored to be able to work with the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, my colleague Andrea Duart, and um, Sarah Wakai, who is now our, our lead in this current iteration of the grant, for a number of years. So we've got, we've got a lot of uh, lessons learned uh, in our history here, and uh, hopefully we can impart some of that to the folks that are not uh, has not been burned by experience. Um, so I'm uh, moving to the next slide. When we consider the data that are available to assess impact for our projects, we are really focusing on three broad data sources. Uh, the first is mortality data, and uh, that would be very straightforwardly deaths by suicide which there are only a few sources of, uh, but there are some complications in obtaining that data, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we also have survey data, which could be the kinds of national data available uh, through behavioral risk factors, surveillance surveys, uh, or could refer to local survey efforts that 
you might do as a part of your program evaluation, where if you're doing a school-based program, you're working with participants in that program or outpatient programs. Uh, survey data can be a very nice resource for local evaluation. And finally, one of the more underutilized resources to understand program impact would be medical claims data. Um, you don't see that much. We have not seen that much in the previous uh, GLSs. And in fact, in Connecticut, we are really, I think, only beginning to understand how it can be used uh, to guide our efforts. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that type of data. So I just want to review the strengths and weaknesses of these different data sources. And I'm not going to cover uh, this list exhaustively. I'm just going to point out the major advantages and disadvantages to, to using these data types. So for mortality data, obviously, this is our ultimate target. We want to be preventing death by suicide. Uh, and there's no better measure than the measure of death. But the problems associated with this are um, really twofold. One is there tends to be, uh, even though this is a major public health problem, a very small number, particularly if we're not talking uh, about a big jurisdiction. The state of Connecticut is not a big state. Uh, we have about 350 deaths by suicide every year. And if we're talking about GLS numbers, we're in the low 100s. Um, so there's very small numbers, very difficult to evaluate program impact using mortality data. Um, also, there are questions about availability. We have had very good access to mortality data through our medical examiner's office. But I do know of some grantees, some jurisdictions that have had some difficulty getting access, uh, reaching agreements with um, the medical examiner. Uh, there really is not a lot of standardization across uh, medical examiners in terms of how they collect and store their data, which could prevent, present a, a different type of access problem. And if you're trying to get these data through uh, death repositories, vital statistics databases, those at times can lag. Uh, in Connecticut, we lag about two years from a death to the official reporting. So they are not necessarily the most available data, and, and given their numbers, do present some challenges for, uh, for using for impact analysis. <clears throat> Survey data really have a number of different strengths that make it appealing, particularly for local uh, small area evaluations. Um, the first is we're getting information directly from our program participants. Um, so we're getting all the contextual information that might be relevant in terms of exposure to the program. So our process evaluation measures can be uh, greatly enhanced by collecting this type of data. We also get access to lots of other information that you can't get out of uh, um, centralized reporting repositories, so issues related to health behaviors, uh, health beliefs. Those are the kinds of things you can really get into to tailor your assessments to um, the interventions that you're presenting. Um, the other great advantage is that there are a number of different statewide surveys. I mentioned the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, which is for adults with a child component in many states. Uh, but for our purposes, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, or YRBS, um, can be a very nice resource uh, to get prevalence estimates, particularly around self-reported suicidal behavior. But then again, that's part of the weakness. Um, we are talking about self-reports when we're talking about surveys. And uh, many folks in the suicide prevention arena uh, don't like relying exclusively on self-reports in terms of evaluating program outcome. Um, Self-reported suicide attempts uh, tend to be uh, fairly small in number as well, so can present some power challenges to any evaluation. Uh, and self-reports to suicidal ideation, um, which can be far more common, um, may be looked upon as, as perhaps not the, the best measure of, uh, in terms of impacting suicidal behavior. The other weakness associated with survey data can be cost. It can be very expensive to collect those data. Um, if you can figure out an efficient way to approach um, the administration of surveys in groups or in other controlled settings or using online resources, then you can greatly reduce the cost. But uh, otherwise, it can be very expensive undertaking. 
And then finally, uh, what is now emerging here in Connecticut is one of the things we're very excited about from a surveillance perspective are uh, claims data. And in particular, we are focusing on inpatient hospitalizations for suicidal behavior. This is a really important outcome where people look at death by suicide as the ultimate target of our intervention programs. Uh, hospitalizations for serious suicide attempts is a really good proxy. Uh, the data that we have used in the state of Connecticut suggests to us that people that are hospitalized for um, this type of event do a lot of damage to themselves. They are hospitalized for an average of five days. Uh, a third of them are discharged to a psychiatric facility. So there's quite a high level of severity associated with these events. But their rates are much, much higher than death by suicide. We have a ten time, tenfold uh, greater risk of hospitalization for an attempt than, uh, uh, than a suicide death. And the other thing about these data is that they really are widely available. Uh, 48 states now participate in HCUP, or the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project, uh, that is sponsored by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. It's a federal initiative. And so many uh, I would assume most, if not all, of our grantees might have access to their data through that national mechanism. Um, also, all-payer claims databases, which include ambulatory claims as well as hospital claims, are now uh, active in 13 states in the U.S. with up to 20 expected to be coming online within the next five years. So there's quite a bit of availability. Um, they have one enormous weakness. Well, two one minor, one major. The major weakness is that they're very difficult to use. Um, requires uh, quite a bit of data management and statistical expertise. Just to give you an example of what you're talking about in terms of data size, in Connecticut, where we are among the smallest states here in the country, we are getting 425,000 inpatient hospitalizations every year. Um, and to get enough data to do some meaningful assessment, you probably want to use multiple years um, and that quickly gets you up into the millions of cases uh, that have to be called and managed in order to be informative. Um, the minor weakness that's worth mentioning is these are claims data. Um, they don't contain information outside of what's necessary for processing the medical claim. Now, there's a lot of good stuff. Uh, you get up to 10 primary and secondary diagnosis codes. So we can look at medical comorbidities, um, and there's a lot of demographic information in them. But uh, the kinds of contextual information that might be really important in evaluating exposure to a program, impact of a program, would not be contained here. So let me just tell you how we're plugging these kinds of uh, data sources into our efforts in Connecticut. For death data, we do have a very good partnership with our office of the Connecticut Medical Examiner. And uh, by the way, I apologize for all the acronyms. There's no way I could make this slide work, though, if I spelled everything out. But I promise to put a glossary together, and we can send that out to everybody on the call. But the, the Office of the Medical Examiner has been a great partner with us. We've been able to come uh, to an agreement as a state agency to receive these data. We, the university is a public institution. Um, it might prove to be a little bit more challenging uh, for uh, private entities that are, are collaborating with grantees, um, but I, I, I think that those can be worked through. Um, there are other potential resources available. Uh, it may be that your death registry uh, has a more timely recording of death and, and presentation of death information, and if so, that can be extremely useful. And then now we have the Federal uh, National Violent Death Reporting System that many states have been funded to participate in. And that should bring uh, not only a lot more death-related information, but also the kinds of contextual information that can come from medical examiners and police departments. Our morbidity data is our state's hospital inpatient discharge database, which our Department of Public Health maintains. Uh, and as I said, at a national level, these data are available through HCUP. And the all-payer claims database systems that are now coming in line should create much greater opportunities to, uh, to rely on claims data for these types of, uh, of impact evaluations. 
Um, and then finally, uh, for surveys, we are relying very much on the YRBS and the BRFS. Uh, we are also using the NISDA, that's the National Survey of Drug and Alcohol Use and Health. Or is it drug use and health? I believe it's drug use and health, which can at times include uh, state-level data that allows quite a bit of general generalizability at that level of geographic detail. Whether it can get you to county or smaller jurisdictions is doubtful. But it is a good resource. It's a very strong survey, national survey, very expensive, and so being able to capitalize on those data uh, would, be, uh, would be advantageous. And then finally, in our case, we have, we at, at UConn have been working closely with the state, with the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, our, our lead on the GLS, um, to really develop a partnership around evaluation, surveillance, and monitoring. And uh, those academic uh, agency partnerships, I think, can be really profitable because of the expertise that oftentimes is only available in the university context. And then coupling that with a leadership uh, at the state level creates a it, what we feel in our case has been uh, a really powerful combination. So I will stop there. I got ahead of myself there, sorry. Um, thank you so much, Rob. That was a really great overview um, of the different ways in which Connecticut um, is using a vast um, you know, variety of Gail, data sources. Um, yes. Yeah, sorry to cut in. Andrea um, wanted to chime in. Oh, right. of course. So sorry. Right. Andrea. Can you, Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. OK. So hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to share that just today, in fact, we had our Suicide Advisory Board meeting this morning. And um, some additional health data that might be very useful for folks is the poison control center data that states have. Um, we have an intervention and response subcommittee that met after the advisory board. And uh, our poison control center um, presented to, to the folks on that subcommittee, which includes the medical examiner's office, the child advocate, and a number of um, foundations and survivors and myself. And um, it was extremely informative in terms of um, in terms of the data types of data that they have on poisoning and uh, related to the healthcare systems and doctors that are at least in our state required to report to poison control, um, and they track it by intentional and, and unintentional poisoning. So that's going to be new for us in trying to figure out how we can best utilize that data. Um, but I thought everybody would be interested in that. I don't know if anyone else is using that yet. I'd, I'd be interested to hear how they may be doing that. Cool. Thanks so much, Andrea. So feel free to chat in um, if you are doing that. Um, you know, we are going to be doing questions or comments. But before we do that, um, why don't we go to a quick poll? Um, and then I did want to come back to something um, that Chelsea from SAMHSA had mentioned um, in the chat box. But let's go to a poll. All right. Hey, everybody. Oh, sorry, Gail. Go for it. Nope, go for it. I, I was just going to chime in, give Gail's voice a break. So continuing with our fun theme for the day, um, our poll, the, our first poll is, if you were trapped on a deserted island, what would you most want to have? Chocolate, attractive person of your preference, Netflix and Wi-Fi, or potable water? I see a lot of people are going for the romance or chemistry element there. Almost an equal number want something to be able to drink. Oh, one vote for Netflix. All right, no votes for chocolate. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so let's go back to our Q&A. And Gail, you said you wanted to um, follow up on something from Chelsea from SAMHSA. I did just want to back up for 
a moment. Bear with me. So while Gail is doing that, um, I'm wondering in response to um, Andrea's question, has anybody else looked at poison control data? I actually found what I was looking for. So if you don't mind, I'm going to jump in while people um, ponder or get ready to answer that question um, by phone or in the chat box. So I was just backing up um, in the chat box to where um, Chelsea had said that they included available, oh, that acronym, Healthcare Costs and Utilization Project um, data in the state level data toolkits that you all um, should have received over the past few months. Um, and that those data were also discussed on the surveillance webinar that was part of your work for preparing for the January grantee call. So thank you, Chelsea. And Gail, this is Chelsea. Can I just also jump yeah. in about NISDA, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, which Julie, Please. thank you for um, typing out all the acronyms. That was awesome. Um, the next version of the data toolkit, um, we are hoping to include um, the new platform for NISDA in that. So um, those folks who maybe don't have um, data folks readily available or have never used NISDA um, will be taking you through that in the same way that we took you through um, HCUP and Whiskers and Wonder and some of the other systems in those data toolkits. Um, and if you have any questions about the data toolkits or as you're working through them and um, have questions about HCUP or any of the others, um, I mean, Rob, I would like to say they could email you, but you can also always email your um, project officer or your PS and we can help you um, work through those systems as well. Thanks so much, so, Chelsea. Um, I'm curious to hear um, from um, grantees in the room today about you know what you just heard from Rob um, in particular, um, and also if you want to speak to the poison control issue. But do you think that this approach would work in your state or in settings within your state, or you know are you already pursuing um, a strategy like this? So, um, Anybody want to chime in here? Otherwise, we'll sort of go around the room. All right. Well, I'm going to start um, with Casey. You are you have the good fortune to be at the top of the list there. Do you want to just um, speak aloud? I don't know. You may need to unmute yourself if you're muted. Um, is this a strategy that you think might work in your state, or is this something that you're already pursuing? Um, or I don't know, Dave, if you'd prefer to, which of you prefers to speak up? Yeah, we're, we're both sharing a phone. So, um, so yeah, I really enjoyed um, all the information, um, and it definitely gives us some direction um, to look at. Um, we do have um, some other state-level um, entities that we're working with to try to get this information, but um, we're definitely going to look into everything that was presented today. And if I can just chime in, <clears throat> what I'm thinking of is that I look at the potential data sources, and I, I don't know, I'm sure other cohorts have done this before, which is whether someone's done trend analysis over the years before to see if the actual deaths, how they track with um, perhaps the claims data and how those track with um, risk behavior. Just just to see whether they're very good proxies or how much noise there is in the different data sets. So if, if previous grantees have, have done that and there is some information to share, that might help us. Um, at, you know, we're just starting, so we haven't even um, gotten those data and started mapping, but it would be interesting to see if others have found that these are useful proxies. That's a great point, Dave, and um, I definitely invite other folks um, on the call to chime in if you have thoughts about that. But I wanted to mention as well, and I was going to—I'll mention this again at the very end—that there is um, a state evaluator, state grantee evaluators community of learning um, that FPRC is hosting that meets uh, every other month, and we just had a meeting, so the next one will be in April. 
but you are more than welcome um, to join that. In the meantime, if you like, you can put that question to that particular group. Um, and Bonnie Lipton is on our call today, and I'm sure she would be happy to pass that along so you could um, you know, funnel that through any of us at FPRC and um, maybe start starting with your PS. And um, we're happy. Oh, and Bonnie just popped up her email there, so even better. Um, but we're happy to, to pass that along. You can speak with Smitha if that's um, easier. Great. Um, all right, so I'm going to go now to um, Cheryl in Ohio. Do you have any thoughts about what was just presented? Is this a strategy that you are um, interested in trying? Or you know, do you think it would work in Ohio? Is this something you're already pursuing? And Jane, you may want to chime in on this, too. Um, in Ohio, we formed a data advisory committee to look at all the different possibilities for data that we could have available, and certainly the strategies that you've suggested would be very helpful. Uh, Jane, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think you all know there's an ongoing um, matching that um, Helen Ann Sweeney and Cynthia Fontanella have um, been working on. So it involves NVDRS data and matching it to the public health utilization, uh, public mental health utilization system data. Um, and that's already been done for um, adults, so the 18 to 24 year old uh, part of our population, and we're going to try, with many steps uh, involved, to uh, extend that to the lower extension so that we have a continuous um, reflection from 10 to 24. So that's one of the things. Um, I really appreciated the discussion about the claims data because um, that's been mentioned by our uh, public health partners and um, is something that we're very interested in exploring since we're collecting a bunch of survey data um, at local levels in hospitals. So. Um, Thank you very much for that. It's appreciated. Great. And maybe we'll go um, to uh, Georgia next. Um, Dorian, I don't know if you want to chime in. Is this something you are using, considering? Do you think it would work? Um, helpful. And Dorian, you may be on mute. Or Sally, if you want to chime in instead? Um, this is Sally. <clears throat> um, I appreciate it too. We're also in, uh, in mental health. I think um, we're, we kind of have two different things in, involved um, around evaluation. Of course, one is surveillance. And I appreciate the the discussion about surveillance. Um, we we have um, of course we use a number of these things internally. Um, we do a lot of surveillance and tracking around um, uh, around deaths um, and suicide deaths uh, in particular. We have not yet like um, met, compared that data to other public health data, and this was really interesting to me in terms of the Garrett Lee Smith work that we're doing. Um, I think it's more the the evaluation components are more of the um, the surveys and really seeing whether um, in the small areas that we're working in um, really our approach to the evaluation is, is kind of to make a logic model about what we think should happen um, in terms of um, first looking at the community and, and our interventions to um, to identify young people and refer and, and that that goes to like our national data um, that's be or our national evaluation and then our local evaluation goes into um, once 
young people are in care, um, how does the care that they receive, the suicide-specific care, have an impact on, on them? So it's kind of a different level. And then I guess the end piece that we would look at is then how, how does that, in the small areas that we're working with, um, relate to the deaths um, and um, the, the, um, the attempts. Um, we, we have a state-level survey um, that is um, comparable to the Youth First Behavior Survey, but it's given every year in our schools, um, and we get lots of data from that um, because there are lots of incentives for the schools to, to give that survey. So um, that's beneficial to us. And um, there, just with our college group, we have started talking about having, the, um, having them advocate to the state for um, a, a college level um, survey that all the public colleges and universities would give. So that would so, give us a really a, a good way to track those 18 to 24, which, I mean, that's where most of our deaths occur. So. Thank you, Sally. I appreciate your thoughts there. And we're also going to loop back to what everybody's plans are for their evaluation um, toward the end of our time today. So you know, we'll have a chance to go into some of this a little bit more. Um, and with that, I apologize, Massachusetts, but we're going to actually go to our next speaker. And um, you'll definitely, definitely have a chance to chime in in a little bit. <clears throat> So I am going to introduce um, Brian Hoppe, who is, as Gail mentioned earlier, he's the Clinical Director of Crisis Services at Tarrant County MHMR and um, was a, is a partner with Texas Cohort 8 GLS. So Brian. Thank you again. Um, a big part of our job, you know, with all the grants that we've, we've worked with, especially with the GLS, um, I am much more kind of the boots on the ground implementation team and working a lot with the folks um, here in Tarrant County, we do have a pretty large crisis services team. And within that crisis services team, um, one of the things that we have is what we call our mobile crisis outreach team um, and a 24-hour call center. So with a lot of our stuff, folks will call in, um, go through an assessment, be determined if they are in crisis, and also at that point, we also discuss if they are um, considered to be just at risk or possibly may just need to be in services versus somebody um, that we use to screen and determine that they are at risk of lethality. Um, one of the biggest things that we um, were able to do and that we really looked at um, implementing was using the CSSRS, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. Um, as we have put that in, that again has, has just looking at being able to collect accurate data instead of just asking questions um, with folks about whether or not they are, you know, a basic questions to say is someone suicidal or are they not suicidal. That tool um, gave us much more accurate information that again we were able to track. Um, once they became part of our care plan, we were much, e much easier to track them. Um, throughout the time as we continue to reassess using that tool, and that's given us a ton of data, um, not necessarily always in the bigger picture, but has given us accurate data and, and a lot of self-reporting that has really allowed us to continue to track these folks and make sure that we are continuing to provide the support and the services that they need to continue to stay safe, hopefully going through to the point where, again, they are able to kind of move on from their crisis and 
and oftentimes get connected with further services um, now that they have um, moved away from the, the current risk of lethality. Um, as the saying goes, everything is bigger in Texas, and that is absolutely true. The difficulty with it being bigger in Texas, as even as Rob was saying, the difficulty at times of getting you know, the surveys back and getting the studies back and finding the data, it, it, is, it is such an immense size to be able to try to do that. Even just in our, in our county that we work in, the opportunity to be able to go to hospitals and get suicide attempts and get data of that nature, um, again, takes such a collaboration and, and it's, again, never, never really considered to be a, in a real time. Um, so at the point that we're at, we are still building those relationships and still trying to narrow down exactly what stats we need um, and what ultimately, again, being more, you know, in the implement implementation side, for me, it really is coming back to our staff and to our team and to the rest of our agency and looking at, it again, what is best practice. Um, one of the things that we were able to do, again, given a county of our size, we were able to build build um, a much better relationship with our medical examiner's office. And at the time, about, let's say about a year and a half ago, we were able to actually secure another grant that allowed to pay, the funding that we received from the grant allowed us to pay for a part-time position within the medical examiner's office. Um, again, what this did is given, given as many deaths as they deal with, with as much work as they have, this was somebody that was focused primarily on getting reports um, about suicides, um, about the lethality, getting that information to us quickly. And another thing that we have here in Tarrant County, um, and I think Tammy will share a bit about it as well, so I won't say too much, um, is that we do have a loss team, which is um, we receive phone calls and from fire departments, police departments, and are able to provide a team um, to those that, have those that have lost someone to suicide. And that may be two years down the road, it may be six months down the road, or it may be actually at, at the time that it occurred so that we will be able to be out there with someone who has also lost someone to suicide to be able to go out there and provide the support and to speak with them and meet with them. So it, it's part of the relationship with um, the grant and part of it with, us, with our loss team that we were able to get in there and really get more information and get more accurate um, data as to, you know, real-time reporting of, of the suicides within our county. Um, again, we, we take that, that information. We always try to check it against our own database, which has been somewhat difficult. Um, when we first started working with the grant, and even at this point, we do not have an electronic health record that is up and running. So a lot, again, of, of our data gather, gathering Statistics, things of that nature, have really come down to a two and three person team looking through charts, um, looking back through risks, getting communicating with different hospitals, trying to get everything that we can. And, and clearly, our state provides us with a, a ton of information, and different surveys, as Rob was saying again, different national resources that we pull from. But for us, being able to see with all the tools that we have implemented, has it actually made a dent? Has it made a difference? Um, at this point, I'm, I'm pleased to say that if we look primarily at um, our county and we look at suicides within our county, what, what we're proud of and what we continue to strive towards um, is that typically over, I want to say over the last year, I believe that only three suicides that have occurred were, were, were clients that were in our, our pathway of care. Um, so looking at that data again to see that, okay, was this person actively um, in care? Were they being treated? Had we implemented different things? Which again, it, it's going back and reporting that data um, to me has always been able to show that yes, what we're doing here in Texas is successful. Um, what we're doing here in Tarrant County has been successful. Um, but again, if we, we really look at how do we put things into place and what do we do with the information, um, again, and it's for us, it's been a whole lot of sitting down with a calculator and just kind of grinding some stuff out um, that continue to just then informs us more to be able to see what else we need to do. So that's, for the most part, what we've been doing here in Tarrant County. 
Great. Thank you so much, Brian. That's really, really helpful to hear your story. Um, we are going to go to a quick poll before we go to our next presenter, and then we'll have questions for Brian and for Tammy um, at the end. OK, this is Gail. Um, so our poll here is, what is your ideal Valentine's date? We've got one answer already. So um, hang gliding, hot tub, any night off from my kids. Hot tub's kind of popular. Hot tub's really popular. I wouldn't mind hot tub and a night off from my kids. <laughs> kids, kid, I only have one, but yeah. I don't know. I think I'm going to have to go with hang gliding. <laughs> if only to bring the number up a little bit. <laughs> Great. Oh, Andrea said my kids are my Valentine. That's adorable. We didn't put that as one of the options above, so I'm glad yeah. that you chatted that in. Um, if anybody else wants to chat in what their ideal date would be, um, you are more than welcome to do that, too. And, and uh, Chelsea, it looks like Gail might be willing to go hang gliding with you. Oh, <laughs> I would. I have to say I've never been before, though, so, you know. Might take a little bit of coaxing. All right. All right. I see Rob typing. Oh, Rob's not typing anymore. Um, okay. So thanks, everyone. Um, again, the clear winner here is Hot Tub. Um, and we are going to move on now to Tammy's um, presentation. So as I mentioned, before, Tammy is the Administrator of Crisis Services with Denton County MHMR um, Center, also in Texas. And, and um, Tammy, take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am also kind of on the implementation side, kind of like Brian. Um, I'm actually one county north of Brian, so he and I know each other pretty well. Uh, we work together on uh, the same GLS grant with Jenna Heiss, who is our suicide prevention coordinator for the state, Texas. And uh, just a little bit about how we did our implementation. Uh, we are doing a zero suicide grant here in Texas, and we implemented um, a couple of best practices in our center uh, for uh, trying to obviously decrease uh, our suicide rates and the first thing that we did was we trained 100% of our workforce in our community mental health center in ASSIST and then we started implementing some other best practices. Uh, we also did the CSSRS like Brian was talking about. Um, we did uh, implemented Barbara Stanley's safety plan for all individuals that received a risk of harm assessment and we also had all of our mental health clinicians trained in uh, counseling on access to lethal means and collaborative assessment of management of suicidality. And so over the course of a year, we kind of implemented all of those things. And uh, the slide that's up just kind of shows when we started the grant, um, the deaths by suicide in our county um, started to decrease. So. Uh, basically, just as far as where we get our suicide data, in Denton County, we have access uh, or we've always had access to almost real-time suicide data because our medical examiner uh, posts all death data on a website. And uh, so we have access to that website, obviously, uh, almost immediately, so any time that there's a ruling of any kind of death or uh, including suicide, it's posted to the internet. And it's usually within several hours to days of the suicide. So we've always been pretty lucky in Denton County to have access to that kind of almost real-time data. Uh, but, um, and, and so I guess we've had pretty easy 
access to um, track the efforts that we've already implemented in our county. And uh, so we um, were able to kind of see right away some of the things that uh, we were doing were decreasing the suicide rates. And we, after about two years, um, the first two years of the grant, uh, 2013 and 2014, we wanted to try to see if there was anything we could increase the relationship more with our medical examiner's office. And like Brian was talking about the lost team in Tarrant County, we wanted to start one in Denton County as well. We actually formed that relationship with our medical examiner's office. So the medical examiner, anytime they get a call, to a suicide scene, they call us and we go with them. So now we have immediate access to any suicide data because whenever they get called to a suicide scene, they call us and we go with them. Uh, we will go to the scene and provide resources to a fam the families and provide support to the families while they're working the suicide scene. And uh, so we obviously have uh, that real-time data for uh, providing um, data to our evaluators and things like that for our efforts in suicide. And our, uh, we are also using that as a postvention activity for our suicide grant because we are hopefully helping those family members reach out for help sooner for uh, suicide prevention. So. Uh, that's kind of the information I have for what we're doing in Denton, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Tammy. And um, before, while folks are thinking of questions, uh, we are going to pull up our last poll. Take us a moment here. There we go. All right. We did the Valentine's date. And last but not least, oh, we need to clear that. There we go. What is your idea of a tasty snack? We've got Doritos, kale chips, chocolate covered pretzels, anything bacon flavored. Tough call. Got a lot of chocolate lovers here, I see. Or at least chocolate covered pretzels. Mm -hmm. oh, that one's definitely taking the lead. Sure, I should have put something else on here that, like, I don't know, piece of fruit or something, but <laughs> limited options. All right. Well, thank you very much. It seems like bacon flavored was a, a close second. Oh, one Doritos vote. All right. And Brian just chimed in with steak. Steak. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we're going to get some more snacks here. Steak wrapped in bacon. Ah, wrapped go. in bacon. Wow. Chelsea taking it to another level. <laughs> Turducken, maybe. Oh, God. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think Brian's on board with that. <laughs> so, um, Tammy, I actually had a question for you and um, maybe some other folks do as well. Um, actually, I had two questions. So first of all, are you able to get from the medical examiner's office whether folks are involved with the um, public behavioral health system or not, or is just more um, because it's county-focused and the um, public behavioral health system is such a big part of the county that you're able to see the impact? We are able to uh, run the data that we get against our system, so we know if they're involved in our, our system, but not necessarily the behavioral health system as a whole. So if they're um, meeting with a, a private psychiatrist or something like that, we wouldn't necessarily know. Mm -hmm. Although the family members, when now that we're doing the loss team and we're going out and meeting with family members, they'll often tell us if they did have a psychiatric history. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, and my other question is, um, actually, two other questions. One is, um, is that data publicly available? Like, is that website public, or is it just because you're within the department? No, it's publicly available. Anybody okay. can access it. 
Do you know how that came about? I don't. It's uh, I've worked here for um, almost 15 years, and it's always been that. It's just been. So I don't know why, but I know other counties don't do it that way in Texas. Uh, but I know that our county has always done it that way. And actually, we have the same medical examiner. There's like four counties that share the same medical examiner. Um, and they just all, I mean, that medical examiner's office posts things to the internet like that. So. Great. Um, do other folks have questions for Tammy or for Brian? I realize I was kind of dominating the question pool there. Well, um, in that case, maybe we should move on to our um, discussion questions. Um, I guess, you know, um, first of all, I'm wondering if anybody else is pursuing a similar approach um, to what Denton County and Tarrant County are doing. If anybody wants to chime in here, I know the Ohio crosswalk um, is a similar concept at a state level. Um, although I think that there's a different, slightly different process that they use. All right, well, let's move on to our discussion questions. Oh, sorry, I was ahead of, I was ahead of the slides. Um, and as people started sharing before what your plans are for showing um, the impact of your grants, especially on suicide attempts and deaths. And um, maybe we can start off with Massachusetts because we kind of, um, you know, didn't give you guys a go before. Um, but maybe we can start with you now. So, Kelly, are you still here? Go ahead. Sorry. Hi, this is Alan Homeland. Hi, Alan. <laughs> How are you? Um, I'm not quite prepared, but <laughs> if you're prepared to hear anything I have to say, I will talk. Um, we are partnering with the largest um, public mental health utilization provider, or payer, I should say, which in Massachusetts is called the Massachusetts Behavioral Health Partnership. And we expect to get data from them, uh, which will come to them from a hundred or more uh, contracted behavioral health centers that will send them data on uh, suicide deaths. Uh, whether or not they receive uh, suicide attempts, I'm less certain. Um, my, the preliminary information I have is that they ask for it, but they don't always get it. So uh, that's an area that I think we can improve the the um, data collection on, uh, but we will clearly use suicide deaths and suicide attempts as a measure of our success. We also, like uh, Denton County, <coughs> are embarking on a zero suicide uh, plan <coughs> with MBHB and with the Department of uh, Mental Health. Uh, just a word about uh, data sources. Um, we are at uh, Department of Public Health, so we have a good many of the databases that, um, that you were talking about before, uh, and we have at least temporarily access to the all claims data because here in Massachusetts, we also have a rather severe uh, opioid um, epidemic going on. And some of the barriers that may exist between state agencies are temporarily at least coming down. And um, we plan to take advantage of that and see if we can do some crosswalking uh, between the all claims data and the um, 
and the suicide uh, death data. Uh, one thing that we do not routinely get uh, is data from private psychiatric hospitals. Uh, we do get inpatient data from the, um, from the private medical hospitals, but not the private psychiatric hospitals. So that the claims data will add something for us. Great. That sounds like some really exciting plans there. Um, can you say a little bit about the, is the hospital claims data through the um, all payer claims database? Or is that a separate system? Um, it's a separate system. It's not through the all claims database. It's the all claims database that we're temporarily having access to. Okay. Great. Um, so anybody else want to expand um, on your plans for showing success? Um, Jean or Cheryl, one thing that I'm interested to see or think about is um, Rob was mentioning earlier that when you have small ends, the um, you know the death data may be really hard to show impact, and you know I've sort of been um, chewing on this issue myself. But how does that work with adolescents um, or, or children, given that the death numbers are reasonably small? Um, you know, in thinking about, as you were talking about extending the crosswalk to a younger age group, I, I think that that's really important, and you can get some valuable information, certainly. Right. Um, but I, I just wonder, you know, if that's, as we're thinking about what to recommend, um, to all grantees, is that a strategy that we really want to recommend, just given that it may be a small n again? Um, this is Jane. There are a couple of ways that we're providing enhancement um, to try to address that issue, sort of. Um, one of them is that um, our center at CASE has been working with the juvenile justice system for a really long time. And so um, my colleague, have a database of 3,500 people, that, uh, kids that they've followed, outpatient with evidence-based um, practices in the community through the juvenile justice system, and they have um, suicide data from the TSCC that they've collected that we have access to, and we also have the in-house. So that's system data and also, you know, a, a few more people. Um, another way that I said that we were going to try to look at claims data, and the other thing that we're doing is to try to offset low numbers with great design. So one of the things that we actually are going to do, I mean, this is like starting because we have the partnerships and we can do it, is a randomized clinical trial on discharges of kids from the Cleveland Clinic's um, adolescent psych unit, which might sound like small numbers, but it's 1,200 people in a year. And uh, we have the ability both to follow them through their EHR system um, to see what services they receive, but also um, we've been given permission to follow them up directly and um, collect all kinds of, um, you know, direct um, subject level data, including um, Columbia's and SIQs and all the kind of demographic data that you would want. So what we're trying to do is to meld, um, you know, the the large system data with um, the clinical follow-up data, hoping that we'll get, you know, something in between that we'll um, speak to in actuality. We're also using the surveillance data. Part of the advantage of going in through the NVDRS, as we're going to do, um, our grant is structured in terms of designating high-risk counties in Ohio because it varies quite a bit from county to county. There are 88 counties in Ohio, and we um, are not going to concentrate on all of them, but want to concentrate on the high-risk ones. Well, so in using the real-time data from, you know, the county-level data that gets submitted, we think that we'll be able to fine-tune our estimates and therefore offer, um, we have a quasi-experimental um, study that we're going to do with CAMS data um, offered to people in the high-risk counties. So it's going to be, you know, some at one level and some at another level um, to try to capture um, a rich, rich picture of what's really going on. Very interesting. 
Thank you. Do other folks um, you know, have any comments or questions for any of the folks, you know, for, for Jane or anybody else um, who is speaking up? Hi, this is Dave in South Carolina. We'll also be using claims data, and I wondered if there's been some attempt to standardize a protocol for using claims data. You know, here are the diagnoses. Here's how you disentangle, you know, different kinds of intentional injury. Um, I, again, not wanting to reinvent the wheel and assuming that, that others have figured out what kind of edits you need to do to, to make the claims data um, useful. So is there some place that either that's been standardized or the different approaches um, collected so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel? Rob, I'm looking at you. <laughs> sure, I felt that. Um, I, you know, that's a great question. And I am not aware of anything um, that would be something like equivalent to what we have with um, the standardized comorbidity assessments like the Elixhauser or the Charlson, which is basically a standardized way of compiling ICD-9s with some exclusions uh, in order to measure uh, patient medical comorbidities. Um, the other, you know, the other thing, of course, is ARC has the uh, prevention quality. And, I mean, there's a million measures that that have been standardized. I don't know if anything related to uh, suicide-related claims with the external causes of injury codes. Thanks, Rob. It sounds like that would also be a really great question to um, post to that community of learning. And if something doesn't exist, uh, Bonnie, I'm looking at you. I, w I kind of wonder whether that group might be interested in putting something together. Just a thought. <laughs> um, other ideas from folks, questions? Um, I am also wanted to make an announcement to ask folks to see whether you've received that received a private chat and there would be like a yellow blinking tab at the bottom of your chat box. Um, this sounds very mysterious. Um, so I actually had a question for um, for some of the folks that mentioned the Columbia um, suicide severity rating scale and how you're planning to use that. And is that to look at changes in suicide ideation where um, you're able to look at changes in their Columbia scores um, or answers to certain questions over time? Or what, how exactly are, are you planning to use that and, um, or have you used that? And I don't know, Brian, if you want to um, chime in on this one first. Sure. Um, it's the way that the tool is set up. Uh, again, it's pretty straightforward and can be used. You can train anybody to use it. Um, there's kind of a short 30-minute training that they do online that just kind of goes over and, you know, shows what's there. Um, and the way that it's set up is that you've got kind of a screening tool that, that is literally six questions. Um, you can also use that as, as a follow-up screening. And then there's a much more kind of in-depth, sort of deeper clinical one where, again, for us, we use it when we get face-to-face -face with um, with different folks. It, um, the, again, it's what we've done is kind of attach some scoring to it so that it helps with our assessment so that we can kind of define where they're at. So we do short screener in the beginning, then we'll come back and do a longer in-depth version that gets more of their history and more of the behavior information. Um, and what we've implemented is that we have to have contact every three days with our folks. So for those that are we're following up on, um, our goal is to always, within about every three days, continue to do the survey with them until we get about um, usually you know three to four weeks of having 
having them come off without the scoring showing any lethality. And it, and it really is such a straightforward tool that it just gives you really good questions to ask them that, that really require them to, to answer pretty honestly. Great, and then in terms of showing the impact, um, are you just looking at the changes in the score over time? Well, one thing that I've that we've done that we've talked about here lately is even looking at our at our crisis line and looking at the number of times that we've dispatched our mobile outreach team, as I spoke of. Part of what that has shown us is that everything once we implemented that tool, the number of calls has increased greatly, and also the number of lethality calls has gone up. Um, so so as far as impact, that helped us almost immediately to recognize um, that it was such a better tool than what we were using previously and so much more in depth that the impact of folks that we were able to identify, again, as being lethal apps, having that risk, um, I mean, that was a huge impact because then we felt like we were better identifying the needs of the community and able to reach those that were at greater risk much more quickly and much more accurately. So from a data yeah. perspective, that's that's helped us on that side. Great. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Sally. Um, we also have a used the CSSRS for a number of years in the state system and the um, safety plan as a follow-up. Uh, and then there's, a, there's actually a a follow-up protocol to the CSSRS. Um, it's called the CSSRS Next Visit Protocol. So mm -hmm. you could track it given that. Um, but I think Brian's idea of linking using the tools and the identification to the, the decrease in uh, other calls um, is uh, a really good strategy. We were able to link our use of the CSSRS safety plan yeah. and follow-up, that zero suicide approach, to the decrease in suicides um, in the um, mental health centers that use them. And there were pretty significant drops when you started using the zero suicide approach, like 50%, 60% oh, okay. that you can document in the number of suicides that the provider organization has. Am I, uh, but the, the other instrument that you actually can track in terms of decrease is the CAMS, uh, Dave Job's CAMS, um, mm -hmm. because you use a tool at the beginning of every uh, every visit um, that the person themselves fills out um, and you can tie that to a number um, and set a number that you feel comfortable with to change the number of visits or whatever. Um, but the, I would say that the CAMS itself um, has, has a way to actually um, show a decrease in suicidality. Very interesting. Thank you, Sally. Um, I think, Jane, I think it was you who mentioned also doing a study using the CSSRS data. Do you want to um, say a little bit more about how you're using that to, to show impact, if, you, if that's what you're using it for? Yeah, um, they've been doing clinical research at the Cleveland Clinic using this CSSRS for some time, and so we would just we would be following their protocol. The protocol um, involves using the standard scoring um, at the different level points. You know, so um, there's a level point for suicide ideation. There's a level point for attempt. There's a level point um, for serious attempt involving medical. Um, necessity and one for lethality and um, so it's it's just kind of based on using those scores. Um, one thing though that that complements the use of the CSSRS is that um, you know we we have the ability to go into the electronic health record in real time. 
So, you know, if somebody comes in as part of their hospitalization and completes this instrument, um, then we have the ability to keep looking in their chart to see, you know, if they presented um, back at the emergency room or if they presented any place else in the hospital, and at those points to ask them, you know, what they've done in the meantime, um, which we think can give us a fuller picture. Wow, that's that's great. That's a really um, exciting tool to be able to have, and that you were able to do that um, just because it's all within the same department. In the clinic system, um, you may remember um, in, I don't remember if it was the first or second campaign, but President Obama came to the Cleveland Clinic to highlight their electronic health record system. Um, it's not unique because it's the, it follows the EPIC system that a lot of hospital systems use, but it was, they were really an early adopter. And so at this mm -hmm. point, the system is saturated. So. Um, you know, when we talk about these kids that come in to the emergency department and then possibly to the inpatient unit, that's from 27 feeder emergency rooms. So it's a saturated system that all has that electronic health record available. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if other um, states have electronic health exchanges, um, health information exchanges, it sounds like that could be something similar that they might be able to use. It might be, um, you know, we're working through a private hospital system. Okay. Um, the clinic is a private hospital system, but the reason for that is because Ohio doesn't have a public um, youth, child and youth psychiatric hospital system anymore. Mm -hmm. So if you had uh, a public um, youth psychiatric system, you might be able to work through that. Great. Um, Anybody else have any questions for folks or, um, you know, plans that you want to share that you're going to be doing? I think, you know, people have already shared a lot here, but um, definitely welcome to hear more about how you're going to show impact over the five years of your grant. Um, going this is on. Cheryl. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, and I'm the project director from Ohio. And one of the things along with uh, what we're measuring with youth that we're doing it, and we're calling caring contacts, and, and this is a practice we've seen throughout the United States and, and other foreign countries of providing a contact call to youth, 10 to 24-year-olds, following a, a visit to an ER, especially if it's determined that it's a suicide attempt. And we're working with, uh, we're trying to set up a pro protocol to take this over Ohio, but certainly we're working with um, hotlines, certified hotlines in the Cleveland area. And this will be also one of the things that's factoring into what we're doing with the people that are seen uh, through uh, Cleveland Clinic to try to show how some of the more modest interventions can really make a difference in people's well-being um, on, on a more cost-effective term, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Great. So we, we, along with the rich data field uh, that we ex, you know, expect to be looking at, we're also looking at, at some other innovative ways that uh, people will be able to, to utilize these systems. Mm -hmm. Great. So this might seem like an obvious question for everyone, um, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So there's a lot of focus from SAMHSA right now on demonstrating impact, and um, I'm just curious that other than other than from SAMHSA, how might this impact data um, being be able to assist your efforts um, in sustaining them past your GLS grant? Um, I'm going to repeat that because uh, I'm getting a message that I was breaking up a little bit. So this um, impact data that you are, that we've been discussing, there's a big emphasis from SAMHSA on getting this data, but I'm also curious how this data might be useful um, in sustaining your efforts beyond the life of the grant. Uh, 
Uh, this is Cheryl again. <laughs> Not, not to monopolize the conversation, but in Ohio, we have recently had included in the budget uh, one million per year for suicide prevention. And we feel that the outcomes from this grant are certainly going to be transferable to programs that we hope could fall under this budget um, area. It's through the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. And uh, we're we're hoping we can set up some protocols that can be followed and implemented across the state. Ohio is a home rule state and has 88 counties and 51 district areas that provide mental health and addiction treatment. So um, it's not like one, one size fits everyone, but we do hope that this can be, some of these things can be duplicated and continued. And we feel that the beginning of the funding is this designated line item for the one million, and it will continue to grow as we see effective means to lower this death rate. Great, thank you. That's that's really exciting to hear about. Other folks? I think the, the key word that Cheryl used is effective, and I think that beyond just the accountability use of these data for SAMHSA purposes is at the state level to try to identify of all of the things we're doing, what are the ones that seem to be a most effective, particularly in particular populations or um, areas so that if there's not enough money to do everything, um, what are the where do we get the most bang for the buck? So I, I think the word effective is critical for sustainability, not just for more money, but how do you spend the money you have wisely. Great. That's a really good point. This is Alan from uh, Massachusetts again. Um, our GLS grant is largely uh, focused on system change. So if we're successful in being able to introduce zero suicide in a number of different systems here in the state, um, it, it's not so much the SAMHSA funding that is going to sustain it. I think it is going to be the effectiveness that is going to sustain it, uh, which makes it doubly important that we're able to measure the progress that we're having or not having, and adjust the uh, strategies that we're using. Thanks, Alan. So we just have a few minutes left. Um, if anybody else has a comment on this question, um, or else I'd have one more to throw out to you, which is, um, you know, what challenges do you think you might encounter Owner, um, in getting or using the data and any, any thoughts on how you might overcome those or folks um, speaking from your experience, um, you know, what challenges did you encounter and, and how did you overcome those? Once again, it's Cheryl. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to monopolize, but I think no, one thing. No, it's great. Go ahead. Our grant, uh, the people that work on the grant did come up with, because we're a private 501c3 uh, organization, and we really, really have to work strongly with our state partners, is we have formed uh, a data advisory committee, and this has made it possible for us to uh, be able to make a lot of those connections and uh, serve on some committees that uh, avail us to re receive data and put cooperative agreements in place. It also is a lot of additional minds thinking of where we can get the data and what will be meaningful in tying programs together. Wonderful. Well, thank you. All right. Well, I think that that was a real, um, people had some really exciting uh, energy with that last question. So I am going to end there um, and go to our 
Um, oh, look, there are discussion questions. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go to what is next. So please do continue to fill out the surveillance questions in your monthly call agenda. Come prepared to talk about your plans and to ask questions. We also will have a data worksheet that we'll be sending out to you um, that some of you may get a chance to use um, on your monthly calls. And again, <laughs> evaluators, join the State Evaluators Community of Learning. And the focus of that particular um, community of learning this year is on um, surveillance and demonstrating impact um, as part of that. So we really appreciate all three of our speakers this afternoon. Um, we are so lucky to have you with us today. Um, so lucky to have everybody on the call. And <clears throat> I will say that also in terms of what's next, um, you will hopefully get to see each other in person at the May uh, 2nd to 4th grantees meeting in Washington, D.C. and continue this conversation there as well. So thank you all so much, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Take care, everyone.